friends, welcome to the All Canadian Reptile Girl. I'm Annalise and I can't see in the dark, but you know who can? The Predator! But you know who else can? Snakes. Well, some of them, okay? Some of them, not all of them. But they do this through absolutely incredible eyesight, but probably not the eyesight you are thinking of. I'm talking about eyesight generated by potentially dozens of extra eyes you might not have really known about. Today we're talking about heat sensing pits. are neat. I don't think we'll ever know the identity of the first person to look at a rattlesnake or python and say, Gadzooks, there's scoops in that serpent snoot. But the first person to actually describe a snake's heat pits was Antoine de Moulin in 1824. That's a long time ago. He noted that they were rich in nerves and sussed out that they served some sort of sensory function, but it wasn't until 133 years later, in 1957, that the actual purpose and heat sensing ability of these helpful holes was finally understood. Sort of. We don't actually have it all figured out yet and we're continually learning and refining our understanding of just how cool this system is. In most cases, it's pretty easy to tell which species have this incredible heat sensing ability. These conspicuous caverns on Monty's face? Yeah, those are heat pits and they're incredibly complex and sensitive sensors playing a huge role in hunting, finding the best places to warm up or cool off, detecting predators, and even finding love. These pits are found on the adorable faces of most pythons and boas, and of course, the eponymous pit vipers. The number and exact placement of the pits on the face varies by species, I'll get more into that in a minute, and are extremely sensitive to temperature differences, which makes sense. That's kind of the whole thing about them. The most sophisticated can detect variances as small as 0 0.002 degrees Celsius. That's two one thousandth of a degree. That is imperceptible. Well, I percept it. Let's check out how they work. The pits themselves are just, well, pits, but inside where the magic happens is a membrane with a series of interconnected tubes that are lined with highly sensitive thermoreceptive cells containing specialized infrared radiation sensing proteins called opsins. Oh, that was a mouthful. <laughs> infrared radiation, if you aren't aware, is heat. When an object emits infrared radiation, it excites these opsins, causing them to send a signal to the snake's brain. While they all do the same thing, heat pits come in different flavors depending on the species. Pit vipers, like rattlesnakes and copperheads, have a pair of heat pits called l'oreal pits on either side of their face, between their nostrils and their eyes. Inside these pits is a thin sensory membrane only twice as thick as a human hair suspended above an air-filled chamber, separating the heat detector from the surrounding tissue. The membrane has a narrow tube linking the inside pocket to the outside world, kind of like the eustachian tubes in our ears. This tube can be opened or closed to equalize or adjust the pressure around the membrane. Can you? Th this is sciencey stuff. You, I feel like you're undermining me. So it can sort of change in tension, allowing it to potentially act as both an insulator and a sort of lens. This configuration gives pit vipers incredible range, sensitivity, and precision. Another variety are the labial pits on the upper and or lower lips of pythons and boas. Rather than a suspended membrane like vipers, these have a fixed nerve-filled membrane lining the backing of the pit. This configuration is pretty darn good, but has fewer and more dispersed nerve endings than vipers, and without the floaty floaty membrane lens, are only 10% as effective as those of their venomous viper cousins. It's thought that this might be the reason why bows and pythons that have actual pits have so many, up to 13 pairs by the way, compared to the single pair that the vipers have. Vipers is, 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 are so good, they only need two. Boas and pythons need some extra help. But sometimes, heat pits are not even really visible at all. In many boa species, like Imperators like Tatuba or Dumeril's boas like Romeo, you may be forgiven for thinking they don't have heat pits at all. But they do! Instead of sensory tubes clustered densely together in conspicuous face scoops, Romeos are more numerous and are scattered in tiny pore-like heat pits across their lips and face. The more scattered configuration means that their range and the sensitivity in detecting heat is far less effective than those snakes with the more air-conditioned holy faces, and Romeo can only detect heat from objects that are really up close and personal, you know? 
Although structurally different, the pits function in a similar way across the board. You've got a heat detecting membrane that is sensitive to minute changes in temperature. The nerve impulses within it are firing at a constant slow rate called the neutral rate. A heat source which is within a neutral rate does not bring about any changes in the rate of firing. Snakes don't really register it with that sense. But when an object is detected that exceeds a certain temperature limit above that neutral range, the firing of nerve impulses increases. Cooler temperatures cause the firing to slow, allowing the snake to see any objects that are either hotter or colder than the neutral state. And when I say see, I actually mean see. Heat pits aren't really all that different from normal eyes if you think about it. They are things on a face designed to receive input in the form of radiation, visible light for eyes and infrared for heat pits and transmit that information to the brain to be processed and interpreted. In the viper's case, theirs even has a lens to increase sensitivity, just like eyes. These ones. The information even goes to the visual center of the brain, a region called the optic tectum. The same place as what the eyes take in. Some neurons all up in there are sensitive only to infrared signals, others only visual, while others still are a combination of both. All of this information is then relayed to the forebrain where it is interpreted and then the snake decides what to do with what it's seeing. Although the snake can see its target both visually through eyes and through infrared, it's still not really known how these two images merge together to enable the snake to see a single image. I mean, it's not like we can just ask them. Well, I mean, we can ask them. They're just not going to give us an answer. <laughs> can you imagine a snake in that optometrist head holding thingy? Is this better or worse? Hotter or colder? See, you can ask them all you want. They won't give you an answer. So it's not really gonna work. In any case, researchers think it is unlikely that one system takes total superiority over the other and that they must work together, with them relying on different systems more than others depending on the situation. Do you think it's like the guy on uh, Star Trek with the hair clip on his face? What? Yeah, the one with the magic headband over his eyes that um, lets him see like heat and visibility stuff and magic space radiation dust or something. I mean, yeah, I, okay. Yes. Do you know who I'm talking I about? I know who you're talking Great. about. We did his it. His name is Jordy LaForge mm. and he's the second best engineer in Starfleet, thank you very much. I thought you said that the, the, the ship he's on is like the goodest one, the... What's it called? The flagstone? Enterprise. The yeah. flagship? Yeah, the flagship of them all. Like, shouldn't they have the best of everyone in their crew if they're the best ship? Which would include him? I, yeah, okay. You're forgetting about Chief O'Brien. Okay? The best goddamn engineer in all of Star Trek. Wait, you mean the, the potato-looking guy with the big ears? Who lives on the big bike wheel? Him? I, I, yeah, I will not... Have you besmirching the good name of Miles Edward O'Brien in this house? He holds that station together with duct tape and like quantum chewing gum. You know what? It's fine. It's fine. Honestly, Miles is pretty great. I just like riling him up. Are you fing kidding me? You're such a nerd. You should see what happens when I say Captain Sisko isn't the best Star Trek captain. Oh my god! I okay, back on track. Dad's had a little juice box and had a little nap and is feeling better. Where was I? Right, the sense is working together. Okay, the snakes that use thermal imaging use a combination of visual and infrared radiation to detect and track an animal and scent too, of course. They use all of this input to go about their day and living life, but they don't necessarily need them all. Snakes missing tongues can successfully hunt without their main tool for collecting olfactory information. Studies show that rattlesnakes with their eyes covered can still strike a rat dead center 99% of the time. Colubrids and many other snakes with no handy heat sensing organs on their face have no trouble finding food. So it really comes down to each of these mechanisms being relied on with, without, or over others based on their circumstances. In terms of hierarchy, I'm a big believer in it. Someone needs to say I'm in charge and that person is me. That's my decision. That doesn't mean that we don't work together. For heat pits, they take priority when something warm is within about a meter of the snake, even less for some species, which doesn't seem very far, but 
heat pits can only really work if they have a limited range. If they could detect heat over the same kind of range they could see, there would just be so much input and noise that it would probably be more of a hindrance than a help to a snake. So you may have noticed that there are some pretty dramatic differences between the size, shape, number, and placement of heat pits between species. Why is that? Well, one of the main reasons is thought to be based on how they hunt. Ambushing or nocturnal species like pit vipers or ball pythons tend to have pits located at the front of their face near their nostrils. This allows them to better pinpoint the location of the prey in front of them and strike with speed and precision. This is very useful if the prey is really small, really fast, or the snake does a lot of hunting at night when you can't see with the eyes. They don't work because it's dark. Other species, like Hobbs, my Mapwoods python, have pits located further back on his face. This placement allows them to detect heat from a wider area, which is more useful for tracking heat left behind by a warm prey item. Some species have them both at the front and the sides, they're just overachievers, like emerald tree boas, as an example. There are obviously other examples I could have used, living arboreally with fast moving birds, flittering about as a main prey item, being able to detect heat from multiple directions and being able to quickly target and strike with precision is a huge advantage for those species. It gives them range and precision from multiple directions. It's just helpful. There are a ton of other aspects to heat pits, how snakes regulate the temperature of the pits, reaction time between the input of the pits and other senses, how they might affect how we interact with our own pet snakes. But I'm trying to keep this video to a manageable length so that you keep watching. I will have all sorts of links in the description below if you are curious and want to know more, but suffice it to say that the existence of heat pits in those species that have them is obviously a huge benefit. I'm sad we don't have them. It allows the snake to hunt in the dark without the need to actually visually see the animal it's hunting. Even those prey animals that freeze as a defensive strategy are still lit up for a heat sensing snake. They are also useful for detecting warm blooded threats such as humans and for finding the best spots to regulate the snake's own body temperature. Some species also use their heat pits to locate and mate with other snakes. So if they're so great, why don't all snakes have them? I mean, you even have heat sensing snakes and non heat sensing snakes that occupy the same niche region, eat the same thing. Why wouldn't they all have them? Good question. The short answer is that evolution is weird. We know, or think we know, that this tree only evolved once in vipers. They nailed it and that's that. But it appears to have evolved multiple times in pythons and boas. So it's really hard to pinpoint and understand when and how and why these groups of snakes evolved pits when others did not. But we know that they evolved in these groups completely independently from each other. This is called parallel evolution, by the way, where two or more unrelated species within a group of organisms evolve a similar trait, usually in response to similar pressures. There is a common misconception that snakes are primitive, primordial creatures. N nothing could be further from the truth, as I'm sure you guys know, you're watching this channel, and they are, as heat detection shows, highly evolved. But like I said, evolution is weird. There's no plan here beyond we, we being living things, have a built-in system where sometimes something new happens. If that new trait happens to help an animal survive long enough to mate, that new, sometimes weird thing can get passed on and on and on. If it hurts more than it helps, that trait's not usually going to make it for long, evolutionarily speaking. It's obviously way more complex and nuanced than that, but you get the drift. Sometimes after millions of years, you get superpowers. Sometimes you get hair in places you don't want it. Uh, when she has hair on her eyes. Who has hair on her eyes? Not you. Uh. And I think that's so cool. So that's it for today. Thanks for coming on this journey with me to learn about heat pits. I think it might be one of the coolest and most underrated aspects of snake biology. Do you agree? I want to extend a special thanks to my friends on Patreon. Here are some now. My patrons are a huge help in the growth and support of my channel. I can't thank them enough, but I try on every video. If you want to lend your support, head on over to patreon.com slash allcanadianreptilegirl and check out the different levels. If that's not your thing, that's okay. You can still help by hitting the like button if you haven't already, subscribe if you haven't already, leaving a comment or sharing this video. All of that really does help out a small channel like mine. Thanks to you all for watching and until next time, remember to nurture all nature. Bye. Stop. How is this as weird as I think it looks? It, it does look a little strange. I'm not gonna lie. It feels strange. <laughs> <laughs>